Bye, friends. Bye, everyone. Bye. Hi. The, the contraption fell apart. Uh, the contraption fell apart, but I've got some playing cards, a chocolate <laughs> bar, a, uh, the outside thing that goes over like the tissue. It's like all lit over here. <laughs> Nice, nice. Mm. Tamara, not everybody had. Amy, are you trying to tell us we're live? <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, for joining us tonight um, for the Stop the Money Pipeline webinar. We're super excited that people are joining us this evening. We're gonna spend a bunch of time talking about why this effort is so important. This effort came together and was launched on January 10th. A collection of organizations have launched a really major new effort to go after the financial industry and really hold them accountable for being climate criminals. We're gonna to talk to you tonight about why that effort is really critical, how it impacts our fight against the fossil fuel industry and work to address climate change. And then finally, really call on you to get involved um, for a major day of action that we're doing during the climate strikes later on in a couple of months. Um, so uh, without further ado, we're gonna jump into it because we have a bunch of really amazing people who are joining us this evening. My name is Liz Butler, I'm with Friends of the Earth and I will be your host tonight. And then we're gonna have Tara who's gonna talk about why um, pipelines, how fossil fuel finance is related to the frontline fight. And then Bill McKibben is going to really go into the big picture analysis of how all the fights are linked and why this is a critical element to the work that people have been doing for decades on this front. And then Tamara is going to talk about why it's critical to address financial um, issues um, in the fight on fossil fuels from a perspective of 350 who's been working on these issues for over a decade. And then Moira um, from Amazon Watch is going to talk about the work to hold BlackRock accountable and why BlackRock is so critical to this effort. And then Jason's gonna spend a little bit of time on Chase and Sultana is gonna talk about Liberty Mutual. And finally, we're gonna have Malik talk about the faith aspects of this work. And Gracie is gonna be our final panelist and she's gonna talk about um, divestment and the divestment um, day of action that's coming up in, in just a little bit. So. What we are going to do now is we are actually going to shift over to Tara, who's going to kick us off tonight. Um, hey, Bridget Ginoa. Sorry. Great. <laughs> hey, Bridget Ginoa. My name is Tara Hauska. I'm an attorney and founder of GNU Collective. Um, calling in tonight with, to be with all of you from uh, Minnesota. We were currently fighting the Enbridge Line 3 tar sands pipeline. Um, so I guess I would just say, you know, the, the connections between the two, you know, I've, I've experienced firsthand. So, um, right after the, the ground fight and the code access pipeline in North Dakota was really, really out of control and they had physically blockaded us into the encampments. You know, there was this kind of call from the front lines of what do we do? How do you help? There's all these people watching from around the world. And we said, go to your banks. These are the people that are funding this. These are the people that are directly responsible for the financing of the project and directly responsible for the financing of the company who is unleashing attack dogs on us, who is working with law enforcement to suppress our, our rights and to remove indigenous peoples from their lands. You know, this is happening right now. Again, we're seeing that with Coastal Gas Link and the Wet'suwet'en people who are up there, um, you know, that have been in, in, in the Onustaten encampment for 10 years now facing removal um, by RCMP for standing on their indigenous territory, standing on their land, standing up for the drinking water of many other people um, in this fight against fossil fuels. And so these banks, you know, when we made this call out a, a couple of years back, you know, we went all over and did these shutdowns and distributed people to shutdowns all over the country, around the world, uh, targeting Chase, Wells Fargo, um, HSBC, these banks that are, are directly behind 
the money that, that fills these people's pockets to do these things to our territories. Um, and I personally have been involved in both bank shutdowns that are like from the front lines, you know, elevating that conversation, elevating that narrative of what actually happens when these projects destroy our territories, um, of what happens when the tech frontier mine is looking to expand the, expand the tar sands industry by 30%. Um, you know, we are bringing the struggle of the front line, reaching the, 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 bo the boardroom itself. And so bringing that into the, the banking space. Um, you know, I would say I've been part of efforts to target the Norwegian Sovereign Oil Fund and have watched over the course of two different meetings with front lines leaders, bringing this struggle of the front lines with them, to them, directly to them, saying, here's all our human rights abuses, here's all of our lawsuits, here's the, the fact that this company never got consent from the indigenous people of this territory, um, but you did all your corporate checks and accountability with the company and not with us. Um, you know, we were able to get them to not only pull out of the Dakota Access Pipeline project, but to announce that they were thinking about pulling out of the fossil fuel industry as a whole. That's a trillion dollar portfolio. You know, ultimately they ended up kind of walking it back to not being invested in companies that are 100% dedicated to exploration and expansion of fossil fuels. But that's setting a tone that many, many, many other financial industries that insurers, that credit rating agencies here. And I'm going to be quite honest and say that, you know, these banks don't, feel morality but they definitely feel money um you know and the company doesn't really care about morality but they definitely care about money and so hitting them in this really direct way brings that frontline struggle to um the financiers and it's something that we all have agency in you know we we put our money in banks somewhere we are in we're consumers and economies you know we definitely have a say and they know that and so doing everything that we can to stand together, whether it's in the bank branch or whether it's um, pulling our personal money out of these institutions or showing up at, you know, their shareholders meetings and showing up in their, in their corporate spaces um, and bringing these stories is, is incredibly important. So I'm really honored to be a part of a coalition that's looking at these critical intervention points as we're fighting for our literal survival. You know, we're at a critical moment in, in human history and it's, it's time that we do every single, um, you know, all these tactics that have been ongoing for a long time that we really try to stand together and, and focus our energy in a way that's effective. So uh, miigwech for the time and for the space, and I will hand it off to Bill. Bill, you're still on mute. <laughs> Let me unmute. And, and uh, look, uh, first of all, uh, Tara, hi. Um, what fun to, I mean, it's, it's always fun to do anything with Tara and with everybody else in this crew. Uh, this is the first thing I want to say. Everybody always says, how come the environmental movement doesn't get everybody to working together at the same time? Well, on this, man, everybody is working together at the same time. It is really cool to see that indigenous environmental crew and to see the Sierra Club and to see Greenpeace and Amazon Watch and Rainforest Action Network and Extinction Rebellion and 350 and a zillion other groups of people. And I'm looking at the chat at everybody who's joining in and just looking at this fight after fight after fight around the country that we've everybody's gotten to be a part of line three and line five and uh you know the power plan in rhode island and a zillion zillion other things from every corner of uh, of the country let me say i'm a little shook right now um the temperature yesterday on the antarctic peninsula hit 65 degrees fahrenheit the highest temperature ever recorded on our on that continent if that doesn't give you some pause, you, well, everybody here it should give some pause to. Um, on the other hand, I'm really excited right now. We just watched last week uh, uh, Georgetown University become the latest uh, college in the country to divest, and the students from uh, who've been working on divestment now for decades, that was a huge win, and it's a reminder, among other things, of how powerful faith communities are and how they could be. So what I'm trying to say is, as we stand here right now, we're looking at the possibility that April 23rd could turn into one of the really great days in the history of the fight over climate and energy. We don't know that's gonna happen, but it could if we do this work. 
yes, we people of, as Tara says, people have been working on these tactics around banks and financial institutions and things for a very long time. And I think of all the, uh, some of this pioneering work that got done up in the tar sands with Molina Lubicon Massimo and Clayton Thomas Muller and uh, so many other people off taking on the banks that were financing, that are financing the tar sands. And then after Standing Rock, all the work from <clears throat> Mazaska Talks and other uh, groups that really organized and pushed, and there's been great work at Rainforest Action Network. <clears throat> that let us know which banks and which insurance companies and which asset managers, the Sunrise Project kicking in. The one thing we haven't done, I think, is have an all out, all at the same time, simultaneous effort to really bring the pain to these guys, to really make them understand that people are sick and tired of what they're doing. This is nothing more than sheer attempt to profiteer off the end of the planet. That's what it means. If you're Chase Bank and you're gonna lend $196 billion, if you're Liberty Mutual and you're gonna be insuring somebody's new pipeline, if you're <clears throat> BlackRock and you own half the oil and gas on the planet, all that's happening is profiteering off the worst thing that ever went down. So our job is to make sure that everybody knows that. And look, not everybody in the world has a coal mine or a pipeline in their backyard, thank heaven. But everybody's got a bank in their neighborhood. Uh, you know, Chase has helpfully located 5,200 branches in the highest traffic locations around America. Uh, there are great assistance in this work because they've set up the pins in the bowling alley and our job is to go bowl at them, you know. Um, to make sure that in place after place on those branches uh, uh, and at the Liberty Mutual offices and BlackRock offices and stuff, there is a presence there on April 23rd that can't be missed. And I'll tell you, when you do this, people completely get it. January 10th was a great dry run. If you haven't watched the little film, uh, maybe Liz or someone can stick it in the chat for people, the link to it, about what went down on January 10th. The best parts, uh, there's great shots of Tara speaking up at uh, uh, Capitol Hill, and there's great shots of Lennox Yearwood giving a terrific speech, and Osprey and others. But the best part is when Liz Butler just tells the guy in the bank, "Hey, we're we're, we're staying here. Um, 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 deal with it." Um, um, and it was very, really good to be in there that day, uh, to have some sense that this most crucial of fronts in this fight is now fully occupied that we are ready to go. Now, I'm not gonna promise people that we can pull this off. We don't know for sure, because these are the biggest pillars of global capital on planet Earth. I mean, this is as big as it gets, okay? But man, the early returns are not so bad. I mean, people have been going after BlackRock and BlackRock blinked pretty big. Uh, a few weeks ago. This new policy announced on climate is not everything that we need, but it's not nothing either. And, uh, and it's a real start. Same with Liberty Mutual. We don't know, you know, if Chase will blink at all. It's a hard fight because who's up there next to Jamie Dimon, but Lee Raymond, the guy who ran Exxon for 15 years and is now the lead director at Chase. So uh, we're taking on a fight. We don't know for sure that, that we can win, but we know that we have to fight it. And we know that if we, and this is the place where I'm gonna end, we know that if we do manage to make progress, the effects will be A, swift, because every stock market in the world will reflect what happens the minute that it happens, and B, it'll be global, because Washington doesn't rule the world anymore, but Wall Street still kind of does. And that money, if it moves, the impact will be felt all over the planet. So important as it is for all of us to be working on politics this year, it's an election year and an election that is obviously of the highest possible importance. It's also just as important this year to be pulling this financial lever. We've got a few months now here before the general election completely heats up and everything. That's why we're aiming for April 23rd. And that's why we need groups 
everybody on this call taking responsibility for a bunch of bank branches near them, a bunch of offices near them. We've got to populate this map. We've got to get people completely engaged. We've got to give people this opportunity because people will come. People do get it. We are ready to go. We just have to have everybody willing to push. This feels to me like the same energy that was around the start of the fight over the Keystone Pipeline. This feels to me like the same energy that was around the start of the divestment movement. This is the next great front in this campaign. And God bless you all for being a part of it. Um, um, it's going to be fun and interesting. April 23rd, we're going to see what happens when you stand up to the biggest money in the world. Great. Thanks a lot, Bill. And then I think we're going to have Tamara from 350 speak. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here calling you from uh, the wilds of Baltimore, where just about anything can happen, and it usually is. Um, I'm here on behalf of uh, all the folks who work at 350 National and the network of folks who are on this call to say that it's hella important that we think about what it means to make fossil fuels bad business. That's been a part of the work that's been going on since day one. So this conversation that we're having tonight fits in that context because stopping the money pipeline is a critical way to address the climate crisis. But we also have to think about where that money goes. Um, if you feel like the folks who have delivered us to this moment would even remotely be charitable if we gave them a second, then you haven't been paying attention. So <laughs> on behalf of the folks who are thinking a lot about what will happen when we win, because the worst thing that could happen is not that we would lose, which would is a thing we've been thinking about a lot across the movement, but what is the vision of if we win? And if we win, we have to be invested in not just cutting off that money, but figuring out where it goes. And for us, that means making them pay. It's just as important that we demand that polluters and financial backers pay for the crisis they've created, and we don't give them too much room to figure out what that means or on what timeline they're going to do it, because what it will leave us with is not enough to solve the problem, not enough to support our communities, and not enough to think through uh, what the future will look like for people who are already being harmed. Uh, some of the discussion today already points to the fact that this is ongoing injury. So if we're thinking about making them pay, we really need to think about what care and repair will be required to rebuild our communities. This is important because we have to call on insurers because while they uh, tell you there isn't quite enough money to pay or they close up shop rather than paying for a fire and flood, they are the, um, the signatories whose names uh, have to be on a document before any money leaves a bank. So we have to make sure all those enablers down to the politicians in the regulatory space, in the statutory space, in your the local state house and in the federal government who are signing off on all of this stuff, they also are folks who are made to pay. So I think it's important that we think about the tipping point we're at and avoid um, getting carried away by helping to accelerate a business that was already scheduled to end. So while we think about stopping the flow of capital, we think about where we're diverting it because the business was always built to come to this very moment. But what they did not count on is us getting together to figure out how to stop them before they claim they're bankrupt and then sell us what? Sunshine or oh, water? Wait, we're, so we're a little late for both of those things. So if they're already in the business of selling us what the future is going to look like, it is in our best interest to stop them before they get where they're going. And that includes diverting that those dollars today. I'm happy to be on this call with folks who have been thinking about insurance since I was in high school. No, just kidding. Uh, if only, but folks who've been thinking about insurance and finance and what it means to undercut the stuff that we see with the stuff that we do not see. There's some really powerful organizing going on and thinking about the next three years as a pivotal place to move our straights together so that KXL and the Williams Pipeline and Line 3 and our family in Canada are not fighting alone for things that, that we all delivered them to in a moment that we are benefiting from, even as we sit in our homes and in our places of work and we go about our day, there are people who cannot turn this off. And so for all of those folks and for ourselves and our own future, it's time to force transformative federal action to, for, to force people who are climate champions to show themselves in the way that they show up in this work. They can do a lot at the state level and the federal level. And it's time for us to expose the role of enablers who are hanging out in the shadows, including banks and financial institutions as they fund the, fuel cost, the fossil fuel economy to our ruin. 
So it's time for us to tarnish their reputations, disrupt business as usual, and demand that they stop financing and betting against us with our own money. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot, Tamara. Um, and now we're going to talk about those companies. So um, go in a little bit more detail, starting with BlackRock and Myra from uh, Amazon Watch is going to talk us through it. Thank you, and, and thanks, Tamara, for that. I think those, those points are really important. And one of, the, uh, one of those actors that's really been in the shadows is the asset management industry. So asset managers are basically the largest shareholders of most of the global economy. They create the investment funds that university endowments use. Um, they, uh, the pension funds, rich people, sometimes even regular people, if you have a little extra cash, they create those funds that, that are used to divest, um, which means that they have enormous power over how that money is allocated. And um, because they hold those shares in companies for others, they get to decide how shareholder votes happen, how board member votes go, um, and so they can make or break shareholder resolutions like the ones in recent years to require companies to adopt climate transition plans. Next slide. So um, here you can see with this, this graph how many trillions of dollars the world's biggest asset managers have invested in fossil fuel reserves. Um, and this is actually a slide, uh, excuse me, a graph from 2018. And so it's even more trillions right now. And as you see there on the left, the biggest firms are US-based companies, and the very biggest is BlackRock. Next slide. So BlackRock controls more than $7.4 trillion of the economy. And a huge amount of that is right now in fossil fuels and in the commodities that drive deforestation. That's a huge behemoth that we need to move, but it's also an opportunity for major change, right? If we can make an entity that controls this much of the global economy, we can really shift the game on the funding for the industries that are destroying the climate. So that's why a number of us launched in October 2018, the BlackRock's Big Problem Campaign to shift this actor and this industry. Uh, next slide. Oh. Um, and then you'll have to click through to the, for the solutions to pop up. So what are our demands from this campaign? Uh, that BlackRock and other asset managers divest from the fossil fuel companies that refuse to change, refuse to transition to a just transition. To prioritize fossil and deforestation free funds, basically make them the default option. So if a pension fund shows up or a new client says, I wanna invest with you, BlackRock is saying, great, here, your option is fossil fuel free, it's deforestation free, it's good for the climate. And BlackRock also needs to use its shareholder power to push companies to align with a livable planet. So, and because BlackRock is the biggest asset manager in the world, this would have huge ripple effects on the economy and it would also move other asset managers. Next slide. Um, and in fact, we're doing that. We are winning. We had a huge win. Bill referenced this in, in his chat in January where BlackRock announced that it was gonna make climate risk at the core of its strategy. It announced it was gonna divest from some coal it, and it committed to push companies harder on climate action. A huge and exciting win, um, but we're not done yet. Divestment needs to happen around all the drivers of climate change, all the fossil fuels, all the deforestation drivers. Um, and we need to harness this momentum to move BlackRock even further. So it's really holding these companies to account, really insisting that they implement just transition plans and to leverage this win to move other asset managers. That's it for me. Great, thank you so much. I think Sulkana is now gonna talk about Liberty Mutual. Great, so hi everyone. My name is Selection. I'm with Rainforest Action Network. And I think Amy's got the slide, great. Um, so first of all, I want to outline why we're going after insurance companies. Because insurance is another invisible but essential part of the fossil fuel economy. Um, as Tamara was saying. So you can't drive a car or buy a house without insurance. In the same way, companies can't build or operate destructive fossil fuel projects without insurance coverage for spills and explosions and all the other dangerous things we know happen when you build these projects. On the right here, you'll see a certificate of insurance for the Trans Mountain Tar Sands Pipeline, 
which is yet another project Canada is ramming through without the consent of impacted First Nations. And if you look closely, you won't be able to see on the screen, but Liberty Mutual is written all over there, which is the key target we're going after in the insurance industry. On the next slide, you'll see the second reason we're going after insurers, which is that they invest a whole lot in fossil fuels. Liberty Mutual alone has $8.9 billion in coal, oil, and gas companies. And the next slide is the third reason, um, which is that these insurance companies know better. They have the scientific models. They know what's, what's happening to our climate. In fact, in a town in Northern California, where I have family, uh, Liberty Mutual dropped every home insurance policy after a bad wildfire a few years ago. And a spokesperson for the company said, dropping clients is a necessary step to manage our overall exposure to wildfires, yet Liberty Mutual refuses to manage its role in, in driving the climate crisis. So we are taking action. Uh, next slide, you'll see some of the ways how. So back in October, we launched a campaign calling on Liberty Mutual to stop insuring fossil fuels. And following the lead of, of 16 global insurers that had adopted coal policies and four that had tar sands policies. And so we've held actions at their headquarters in Boston and offices in Seattle. Bill McKibben skewered them in the media. We had current and prospective Liberty Mutual employees speaking up and they're starting to listen. So in December, next slide, um, we, uh-oh, could you click one more? <laughs> I think, I think it just needs another click. All right. <laughs> so Liberty Mutual adopted a coal policy in response to public pressure, as you'll see there. So it's, it's clear they're listening, um, but it's not enough. Like Moira said, we are just getting started. The policy has major loopholes on coal, and it doesn't touch tar sands or oil and gas at all. So what's next? Next slide. We are going to continue campaigning because we know Liberty Mutual has to do much more to really meet the scale of the climate crisis. We'll be highlighting the role that Liberty Mutual is playing in supporting the tar sands sector, since they're one of the biggest insurers of that sector. They're insuring Trans Mountain Tar Sands Pipeline, providing um, money to Keystone or to build Keystone XL and likely involved in the Line 3 tar sands pipeline as well. So we're going to be calling them out for their role um, in violating indigenous and human rights and for, for facilitating the expansion of that destructive sector. Uh, we're going to be mobilizing policyholders to exercise their rights because Liberty Mutual is actually owned by every single person that has a car or home or whatever type of insurance. So I'm going to throw in the chat right now a link where you can share if you're a policyholder and we'll get in touch with you um, to talk about how you can use those rights. We're targeting offices, their biggest offices in Boston, Seattle, and Texas, but they have so many more. So if you want to join the campaign, we, yeah, please be in touch, fill out that form, let us know. And as we'll hear about later, take action on Liberty Mutual during Earth Week. It's clear they're listening. And now we need to get them to go further. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I think that we are now going to hear about Chase. Jason. Thanks. Yeah. And, and thanks to everybody for being on this webinar and, and all the amazing panelists. This is quite a lineup. Um, so, yeah, I'm gonna, uh, my name is Jason. Uh, I'm with uh, Rainforest Action Network. Um, and just gonna say a bit about uh, the role of banks um, in driving climate change and, and JP Morgan Chase in particular. Um, so one headline number to know is in the three years after the uh, adoption of the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, um, 33 big global banks uh, put, um, 1.9 trillion, uh, that's trillion with a T, uh, dollars into uh, the fossil fuel industry. Um, that's through just through their lending and underwriting. Um, and, those, uh, and those figures went up each year post Paris. Um, on the next slide, you'll see the worst of the worst. Um, these are the dirty dozen banks um, uh, post Paris. And 
the thing that jumps out, number one, this is very much a US problem. Um, but number two, JP Morgan Chase is number one, and not only number one, they're number one with a bullet by an almost 30% margin. Uh, they're the worst fossil bank in the world. Um, and those numbers are trending upwards as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, I mean, that's the headline number. And in a way, that's all you need to know. They're the biggest funder of fossil fuels. But if you look at basically any specific slice of the fossil fuel industry, they are, they are also the worst. Um, they're the biggest uh, banker of fossil fuel expansion. They're the biggest banker of Arctic oil and gas. They're the biggest US banker of coal mining. Um, on tar sands, they're, um, they're financing uh, for the tar sands industry post Paris is, is more than the other big five US banks combined. They're the only bank um, anywhere uh, that's linked to all four uh, of the major, the current major expansion projects. Tara mentioned Line 3, um, Keystone, uh, Trans Mountain, uh, and, and the Tech Frontier Mine are also in that mix. Um, and they are by far the, the biggest banker of, uh, of co Coastal Gas Link. Um, next slide, please. So that's the problem. What are they doing about it? The answer is not much. They have no policies whatsoever restricting any area of oil and gas. Um, they do have some coal policies. Um, so we know they can rule things out if they want to, if they're forced to. Um, but our job is to, um, is to strengthen those policies quite a bit. What do they have to do? There's sort of three things. Number one, um, they have to stop financing expansion of fossil fuels. Um, if you're in a hole, stop digging. Uh, number two, they have to phase out their fossil financing uh, on, a, on a serious timeline. And number three, this should go without saying, but it, unfortunately it doesn't, they have to stop financing rights abuses. It's human rights, especially indigenous rights. Um, next slide, please. So in fact, we can anticipate that they are going to make a step next, uh, like pretty soon. Um, we can also predict that, that it's not going to be enough. So in December, um, after some really amazing advocacy by the Gwich'in Steering Committee um, and, and other allies, um, Goldman Sachs adopted a, a really important new policy, um, stepping away from coal and, and, and Arctic oil. Um, and just we know that the big six US banks move in lockstep. Um, back in 2015, 2016, um, Bank of America introduced a coal policy. Within 10 months, the other big five banks had all uh, introduced basically a carbon copy um, coal policy. So Goldman Sachs moved. We can anticipate that the other big US banks are, are figuring out what their responses are going to be. And that will absolutely um, include JP Morgan Chase. But um, we know that that is not going to be enough. Just copying Goldman Sachs is not enough for the number one fossil bank in the world. So our job now is to push them as hard as we can. Um, and if all they do is, is copy Goldman, come right back and push them to do much more. Um, next slide. And that work is happening, uh, right? There's been an absolute groundswell of activism targeting Chase, um, and they are starting to listen. Um, next slide. And um, just to highlight a couple of tools, there are a range of tools out there, but just to highlight a couple of them, there is an organizing toolkit um, that we pulled together, um, kind of drawing on all of the, the work that's already been happening. And coming soon, um, we'll be rolling out more to tools um, to offer folks ways to move their own money, move their institution's money, um, push JP Morgan Chase shareholders on some, some really important shareholder resolutions that are coming up between now and May. Um, and just to highlight a couple of other dates in the next few months, um, in the middle of March, we're gonna see the, the, the next edition of the big annual uh, fossils and banks report, Banking on Climate Change. That'll give us more ammunition uh, to, to throw at JP Morgan Chase. Folks have mentioned Earth Day. Um, and then all of this is building towards the JP Morgan Chase AGM uh, that we think is gonna be around May 19th, um, location TBD. So stay tuned for that. Thanks. Great, thanks a lot. And now we're gonna have Malik talk about the moral reasons for a campaign like Stop the Money Pipeline. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, all the uh, presenters so far have been amazing. Uh, I'm just grateful to be a part of this uh, discussion uh, as a person of faith and representing many faith communities. Uh, as you all know, uh, Green Faith is a uh, multi-faith global organization, uh, and we have come to the uh, conclusion that uh, faith and people of faith matter in this movement because of the moral voice that we bring to the table. And uh, our traditions, our spiritual and religious traditions throughout the world have uh, led us to this place because we believe that the planet is suffering. And when the planet is suffering, there's a need for those of, of people of faith to have compassion towards the planet and help alleviate the suffering of the planet. We also know that there are frontline communities, indigenous communities, poor communities, uh, that are experiencing uh, suffering as well. So we know the planet is suffering. We also know people are suffering. And when the planet and the people are suffering, that is a moral call to have compassion and show love and, and, to, and actively get involved in helping to alleviate the suffering of people and the planet together. And that's our moral call. That's our, our moral commitment uh, as green faith and as people of faith uh, throughout the world. Uh, but we also know that what's standing in the way of alleviating that suffering is profit. We have seen historically how profit has been placed above the planet. It's also been placed above people. And, and that ethical issue has made us more determined to make sure that our faith responds in a way that not only stands up and says, this is wrong and this is immoral, but began to ask people of faith personally and all of their institutions to divest from fossil fuel, to divest from practices that support the continued extraction of resources that continue to poison the planet and the people who are adjacent to these facilities and to these uh, poison lands, waters, and airs uh, that we are uh, seeing happening internationally. And so we're, we're, uh, we're moving forward and responding because we're uh, offering up an opportunity for people of faith to join us on April the 23rd in what we're calling a prayer in. And the prayer in is basically getting people's faith to do what they do most often first when they hear something as immoral and not as an issue, and that is to begin to pray together. And from prayer comes conversation, and from conversation comes action. And so we're hoping that people throughout the world can join us uh, of faith to uh, begin to participate in this rallying call uh, to go to targeted prayer hands on April 23rd and represent their faith tradition or their spiritual uh, beliefs that this is a call to action for, for all people of faith and who have a moral uh, commitment to this change. Thank you so much. I think now we are going to have Nadia talk about the um, divestment efforts and the upcoming divestment um, day of action. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Um, would it be possible to have the slide for this up? Thank you. Cool. So I'm Nadia. I'm filling in for Gracie from Divest Ed. Um, I am a former Divest Ed fellow, but primarily right now I'm an undergrad student at Cornell and I'm also a fossil fuel divestment organizer. Um, I'll just wait for, okay, awesome. Um, so Fossil Fuel Divestment Day is coming up this Thursday, February 13th. Um, fossil Fuel Divestment Day also goes by F2D2 because of the two Fs and the two Ds. Um, so Fossil Fuel Divestment Day is a day where campuses across the globe are gonna show up and escalate more than ever before, asking their universities to divest from fossil fuels and reinvest in a regenerative economy. Uh, my campus in particular is involved and I'm super excited about this. Um, we are going to have a, a mock wedding. We're marrying our university and um, the fossil fuel industry and then we're taking over the streets. So yeah, uh, super excited. A lot of actions across the globe. Definitely keep an eye out online um, and we, the purpose of this day is to show that this movement is not just like a bunch of isolated campuses asking their universities the same thing, but a unified movement. And to make that movement as strong and unified as possible, we really need your support, um, largely on social media. So at the bottom of this slide, there's a link. I can share it in the chat if it's not there already. Um, yeah, just shared it in the chat. We have um, a bunch of sample social media posts for uh, what you can put on your social media, um, advertising and just blasting this event. Yeah, so we just want like every school to know that 
if they don't divest, it's not just students at their school that are gonna be upset, it's like the whole world. And we are riding on a ton of momentum. Georgetown just divested a week, like Thursday, which is a week before Fossil Fuel Divestment Day. Uh, University of Pennsylvania just partially divested. The Harvard-Yale football game gained so much attention. And so student divestment is finally coming into the forefront of people's minds. And that's super exciting for me as a student organizer and someone who's like kind of new to organizing. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm really glad to be on this panel and would appreciate your support so much in just blasting this as much as you can, given that it's just this Thursday. Thanks. Great, thanks a lot. I think that we're gonna go back to Tara for a second to talk about something that's happening right now in the connection to this work, and then we'll talk about the, the day of action that's coming up. Tara? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'm glad that we were all very fast. That usually doesn't happen. So thanks to everybody for staying right on track um, and for all the great words. You know, it, I wanted to bring up, I don't know if folks have been following it, but today there was a, um, a car that drove through a bunch of supporters of the Wet'suwet'en people um, up in Saskatoon. And there's a investigation that's been opened by the Regina police. Um, I think that, you know, they haven't identified anybody as of yet. And I think we've seen on this side of the medicine line that when something like this happens to people standing in solidarity or demonstrations of really important issues, that oftentimes like it just falls to the wayside. Like there's outrage and then nothing happens and unless someone was killed, like it's just business as usual. Um, you know, whatever we can do to share it to our networks to pressure the Regina police station to actually press charges against this person that I mean, there was indigenous people on the hood of a car today. Someone could have been easily killed and a lot of people are gonna walk away with a lot of trauma today. Like that is what we're talking about when we're, like these issues, divestment might feel kind of really disconnected, but like the, the violence that's being enacted on the earth is the violence that we're seeing in our communities. It's the violence that we experience to our women and our vulnerable people by these people that build these pr projects. And it's the violence that we see of, of, the, of general society against anyone that dares to stand up and do something different. So, you know, I wanted to make that connection and I, I, you know, there are four different banking institutions. I believe Selection is gonna put in a blog post about who's behind um, the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, but, you know, I, it's, it's so important for us to, to remember that we have to center front lines impacted communities in these fights, that it is, um, the brown and black folks that are bearing the brunt of all of these different forces of destruction, um, that racism is absolutely alive and well and, and, it's, and it's reflected within these projects. That is a reality. Um, you know, the racism of Canada towards its First Nations people is the racism against the United States or to its indigenous people. It's the racism that we see all over the world. It's colonialism, it's destructive and it's deadly. So um, yeah, the Regina police station, so, if you can give them a call, send them, send them a note, something like that. So, so we get some form of justice and also support the coastal gas link struggle. Um, that's the Unistaten encampment. So U-N-I-S-T-O-T-E-N. -E I can put that in the, in the chat. Um, they also have a bail fund and all of that, and we should be doing our best to blast that out and support them. But that's it, Miigwech. Thanks a lot, Tara. And I think that's why this effort's so important. We cannot let these, financial institutions not be held accountable for that type of behavior. Like they are ultimately responsible. These projects would not happen without funding, without insurance. They are just as accountable as the people who are actually drilling in the ground. And we have to make sure that we bring it to their doorstep, which is why we're asking all of you as part of the global climate strikes that are happening in April, on April 23rd to join us for the day of action on Stop the Money Pipeline. It's critical that every location of Chase, that Liberty Mutual, that BlackRock, across the country really feels the pressure of their relationship to this work. That they cannot pretend that they are not directly responsible for what's happening in these communities, that they are not directly responsible for boys meeting people's land, that they're not directly responsible for that car because ultimately they are by the fact that they're giving the resources to make all of this happen. So um, Amy, can you put up the slide? 
slide 22 about the TA of action. And then we're going to talk about how everyone here can get involved. Um, so it's going to be Thursday, April 23rd. We're asking you to host an action in your local community. So top ask. But don't worry, we're going to train you. We're going to give you so much information to make this as easy as possible. We want you standing with all the different groups that are on the phone here today, as well as students across the country, people of faith, making sure that the, the message to these corporations, that they are just as accountable and they can't keep just profiting off of the destruction of the planet and communities. Um, can you put up the next slide? So here's how you're gonna do that. The first thing what we want you to do is to go to stopthemoneypipeline.com and to sign up. You're gonna actually be able to register as a host starting on February 17th. And if you have questions, which I bet a bunch of you do tonight, like we went through a ton of information in a very short period of time for how many people were speaking. It's kind of a miracle, um, but we want you to send any questions you have to info at stopthemoneypipeline.com. But we are gonna be sending out all the information from tonight's webinar. That means the slides, that includes who was speaking, what they were talking about, but we're also in the process of making a how-to toolkit, and we're going to be running trainings for people who've never hosted an action before. This, we are going to work with you to make it this day as big as possible, but we are asking you to clear your calendar and to make sure that you start organizing now in your community so that we can make this as large as possible. It's time that the financial institutions feel the collective accountability on these issues and that we make sure that this comes to their doorstep in every town across the country. So I think that um, is what we have for the night. Unless anyone of the other panelists would like to say something before we end. I just want to say we got we to gotta do this. We've got 5,200 Chase branches. We've got a bunch of offices from BlackRock and Liberty Mutual. And we have got to demonstrate that there are enough of us to, to, to be at those places on April 23rd. This is a test for our willingness as a movement to really get out and organize in ways that we haven't before. And I know we can do it. I know that people will be engaged if you, each of these places, or if everybody, if all the groups that are on this call are taking 10 or 15 of these bank branches or things as their responsibility, if they're kind of adopting them and taking them, you'll be able to get people to come out to help you. We will make sure that we recruit people across the nation in every way we can, but we need your leadership place by place. And it's not all gonna be civil disobedience and arrest. Some places people will be doing informational pickets or pray-ins or teach-ins or whatever it is. We just need a presence out there every place because these are enormous institutions. And unless you actually bring some real pressure, they won't feel it. They are heavily insulated by the amount of money that they have in their coffers, but they're not invulnerable either. If you're Liberty Mutual, you got to sell people policies. If you're Chase Branch, you've got half of America with a credit card in your wallet, and every one of those people with a credit card in their wallet has a scissors in their kitchen drawer that they can use to cut it in half. And if we all do it at the same day and the same time, if we're out making this witness, then this is going to be a spectacular day. This is, well, this is an honor and a privilege for everybody to get to work on this. We're going at the absolute heart of the absolute machine that is driving the worst thing that ever happened on this planet. And we have a chance here, but we got to seize it. So thank you all so, so much for being a part of it. Thank you. And thank you to everyone tonight. Amy, could you really quickly throw up the slide that has a list of names just so people can see all the great folks that they heard from tonight? Um, I, you're going to be getting all this information as a follow-up, but really take to heart how important this effort is, how it connects to all the efforts that many of you have been involved in on fighting pipelines and fighting fracking and fighting for communities and fighting on social justice and racial justice and economic justice. We have to go after the resources, 
they need to be held accountable and made sure that they can't just keep funding these projects and have no one know about it, that we're not gonna go away until they stop, that we're not gonna go away until they stop building pipelines, that we're not gonna go away until they stop funding pipelines, we're not gonna go away until they stop poisoning communities, we're not gonna go away until they stop hurting our folks. All right, I think on that, um, we're just talking to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Take off mute and say bye to everybody real quick. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, y'all.